some of the nation's defining moments and its criminal legends have all tread a common path. Whenever there has been a crisis or a serious problem in society, invariably the Supreme Court has been right in the thick of it. The Supreme Court of Victoria was established in 1840 via New South Wales legislation. The following year, Judge John Willis was dispatched from Sydney. Willis has got an interesting reputation in Australian history and I think the, the Supreme Court bench in New South Wales was glad to be rid of him. So he was sent down to Melbourne. For years, the court was housed modestly in the city, but increased demand and a colony flush with gold money led to a design competition. The building itself is, was the biggest and most expensive colonial building project in Australia, and it takes up a whole city block. The gold rush also led to some of the first corporate regulations in the country. In the 1890s, when the big collapse occurred, the judges were making significant statements in court about the victims of the fraud and corruption of different individuals. Then if we fast forward right on to the 1990s and we think of the collapses with uh, bond holdings, uh, the Christopher Scase case, it's been this court that has had to sort them out. The Eureka Stockade pitted police against gold miners in 1854, an important test for the court, not just in criminal matters, but in business too. Around that time, bushranger Ned Kelly was born. He's still the court's most famous client. It was before Sir Redmond Barry, and it's got what he was tried for, so it's murder. It's got what his plea was, which is not guilty. It's got the verdict, which is guilty, and it's got the sentence, which is death. It could be a 19th century artifact. But what we've got here is the black execution cap, and that's placed on the top of the judge's wig. When he said, you know, that you're sentenced to hang until you are dead, and may Lord have mercy upon your soul. The court has determined social policy too. One of the first divorces was actually Justice Molesworth, a judge of this court. Unfortunately, he accused his wife of sleeping with what seemed like half the bar. We're not sure about that. A 1969 trial of Melbourne Dr Charles Davidson set a nationwide precedent on abortion. Mr Justice Manhattan said that an abortion could be held to have been performed lawfully if the doctor honestly believed on reasonable grounds that the woman's life or physical or mental health would be endangered if her... That became the whole um, underpinning principle of, uh, of the law about abortion um, in Australia. We don't, we don't think a lot outside our own, our own area though and I'm not always sure that we do understand what influence elsewhere some of the things we decide have. Just as Paul Coglin has seen the court from every angle as defence counsel, public prosecutor and judge. One of the very unfortunate features of this case is that others seem to blame themselves for what you have done. They should not. You did what you did. You are responsible for it and nobody else is. Over almost five decades he's witnessed great technological change and a shift in who is in court as well. When I was admitted to practice in 1969, there were no female judicial officers. There were at that time no female clerks of courts, let alone magistrates or judges. Um, so that change has been enormous. The first woman Supreme Court judge was appointed in 1996. Two years later, Marilyn Warren became a judge. In this courtroom, I conducted my very first murder trial. In 2003, after 13 years on the bench, Ms Warren became the first female Chief Justice in Australia. Congratulations, Chief Justice. Last year, we had a quite momentous occasion in a commercial appeal in the Court of Appeal where I sat with two women colleagues. So there we were, a bench of three women, and we had appearing before us women counsel. A great day in the court's history. Every time I go into court four, I always think of Jean Lee. Jean Lee was a single mother turned prostitute, caught up in a vicious murder robbery and the last woman to be hanged in Victoria. And I've often wondered if she had some of the top QCs we now have at our bar acting for her 
if the outcome of the case might have been different. In a corridor, a man armed with a 38 calibre revolver came up behind them and began shooting. Murder cases have dominated the court, but in its more recent history, it was the scene of a horrific crime. It wasn't a criminal matter. It was a family dispute about money, of course. And um, someone came in with a gun. So now, of course, days everybody's checked. But in those days, he came in with a gun and chased the, um, the family member and shot and killed two or three people, which was quite scary. The Supreme Court of Victoria has hosted some of the wickedest men and women in Australia. These cells are no longer used, but they're part of a rich history of an institution that since the middle of the 19th century has set legal precedents, shaped social policy, even had its fair share of mystery and scandal. And if you believe the stories, there's also a ghost. One of the judges tells me there is a ghost in one of the courtrooms, which I haven't seen the ghost, but he told me it was of a little boy. Have you experienced the ghost that's supposed to be in this No, meeting? no, I haven't. But I'm not, uh, I suspect I'm not the sort of person who would. Well, I'm always amused. It's always said that the ghost is a he. I suspect the ghost might be a she. There's a wind that quietly whistles down the corridor and I think I heard her one night. I'm not sure, it might have been Jean Lee, it might have been somebody else, but I'm sure she's around somewhere.